What's up, guys and dolls, dudes and dudettes, mummies and monsters? This is Talking with Burritos, the podcast that's giving you something to talk about when you want to stir up some ancient dust with The Mummy, circa 2017, starring Tom Cruise, a.k.a. The Last Action Hero. Is this movie terrible? Yes, and that's just me giving it the benefit of the doubt. But will it ruin the Dark Universe as a franchise? No, I don't think so. What The Mummy does for Dark Universal is it made it harder for the studio to establish that all-important thing that audiences love, and that's credibility. As inconceivable as it may sound or is right now with the release of this horrible version of The Mummy, The Mummy 2017 just might not be the end all stake in the heart for this franchise. Pun intended. There is hope and it has webbed feet. Also, the truth about watching movies. Criticism in the age of easily accessed opinions. As movies continue to fail at the box office, a lot of people are starting to point fingers at who's at fault. Is it the studios? Is it the critics? Or is it us, the audiences? I got a couple of jokes. Now check this out. Yo mama. So old, they buried her in bandages. Ooh. Yo mama. Here's the second one. Yo mama, so old, she knows Brendan Fraser. Now, that last one was a dig at the fact that has anyone seen Brendan Fraser act in anything since Tarzan? I know he was in a few movies afterwards, but he's kind of like Bigfoot or Val Kimmer, where every now and then he shows up, but you don't recognize him. So maybe he's out there lurking, acting, but we just don't see him because he's not, you know, mainstream right now. I don't know. You know, I started this discussion of Kong and the creature feature monsters spawned from nature's creation. But now we're going to enter into the creature feature rooted in the monsters sparred from our imagination and fears. Between the 1930s and 1950s, Universal, the studio, Universal Studios, produced many monster movies and labeled this thread of films the Dark Universe. And although they were monstrous in their actions, Dracula, the Mummy, Werewolf, and Frankenstein, they were all human-like in, in their origins. Most of them plucked from English lore and adapted into motion pictures. This new wave of successful monster films made Universal a contingency, a major contingency in the film industry at a time when cowboys were a dime a dozen. Like many things in Hollywood, the creature feature movie had its moment before audiences moved to the next best thing. And that was like in the 1970s. You had movies like Jaws, Aliens, Night of the Living Dead, as I mentioned before in the previous episode. And now these horror movies came with credibility backed by money and ingenuity. Cheesy string effects and damsels in distress were replaced with violence and neighborhood evils we could all relate to within the world of our own realities. I can't say I was a huge fan of the creature feature monster movies, especially the baleful black and white films popularized in the 20 years before American syndication. They weren't cartoonish and not comical like the monsters television show. They really did freak me out. I spent most of the time during these movies watching through my eyelids. So I'm not an expert nor too reliable a witness to account my experience as a young boy watching what was then the only horror movies I had access to viewing. Relaunching the creature feature films of the Dark Universe as this new franchise is brilliant. However, it's flawed. You know, it's, it's 
introduction to the contemporary media of today. Most of us older folks know the Mummy films as, and I'm old, I'm four damn near 40 years old, and I mostly know the Mummy films as Brendan Fraser playing an Indiana Jones-like character in search of artifacts and touring around the world where curses result in serious repercussions. Now, those movies were good because they were a fun and well-formatted reimagining of the less action-y mummy films of the 1930s and 1940s. There's a stark difference between the two. The 1999 mummy films introduced the character or concept of the mummy to audiences in a different way. It was fun, fast-moving, action-packed, comical. Now, you fast forward some 20 years and we get the same type of mummy movie with Tom Cruise as a fast talking Tom Cruise, a tomb robber who helps to unearth a secret hidden thousands of years, which is simultaneously being sought after by a nefarious, no good do gooder, Dr. Jekyll, aka director of the Tour de Ressons, Bureau of Antiquities. And I believe that was a knock to their book and the original movie. This 2017 mummy actually made worse the 1999 mummy that still holds up. The two stars of this movie, Cruz and Russell Crowe, added no additional benefit to the film than to have attached to this project a couple of notables for the summer movie tempo plot. The inclusion of Dr. Jekyll was an obvious assemb- attempt to set up the franchise rather than serve a much needed purpose for this movie. Russell Crowe, or the actor formerly known as, dials in an underrated performance for a role he doesn't fit. Jekyll has always been presented as a more suave Englishman. Crowe's interpretation of this scientist on the edge was more brutish in stature and less believable in his portrayal. You never really believe that everything he says is the truth. So I guess he fits the role as a shyster but not necessarily a mild-mannered introvert. The better casting would be to have Crow as the director of the Bureau of Antiquities and Dr. Jekyll played by someone like Hiddleston or Jude Law. Tom Cruise needs to get back to work and take on roles that are less saturated in action and hijinks and that are more challenging to his acting abilities. And I love Mission Impossible and Edge of Tomorrow and hell I'll probably love this Luna Park movie however I do miss seeing him stretch his own acting abilities further than they have gone before that sounds like a Star Trek metaphor movies like Collateral my all-time favorite and Magnolia which I haven't seen Born on the 4th of July Interview with the Vampire Jerry Maguire A Few Good Men Tom Cruise can act We haven't actually seen him act in a while. And so that's not really to harp on him and like really give him shit for acting because, you know, he is still acting, but he is a privileged actor where he can just point at a project and say, I want to do that. And then he can do it. So why doesn't he choose more roles that are, I guess, more dense with um, drama and then action? I'm not sure. But if you're Tom Cruise and you just want to have fun doing the projects you like, then you can't really fault him because he's having fun doing what he likes to do. Ever, I think we lose out and as audiences where there's, I think, you know, there's more to him and there's probably more that he could give to the film industry or do give to certain other projects that will, I guess what, catapult him, put him higher on the spectrum of, Supreme acting greatness, Hollywood greatness, because he's already good. He's already could be, you know, considered great. But yet the movie star is dead. Not so much as, you know, they're all dying. But as far as movies go now, we don't depend on the movie star as much as we do the franchise within the studio space. And that's why you have studios scrambling like Warner Brothers with their Justice League or their their comic book series movies doing the creature feature universal universe thing. What is that universe called? 
Okay, just to interject myself, that universe is called, over at Warner Brothers, the Monster Universe, which causes all types of confusion with me right now. And it's why I'm actually doing this three-part series, or maybe four parts, is because what constitute as Monsterverse versus Creature? I thought Kong was Creature. The monsters are what I'm talking about in this universe. So, okay, I just want to interject. It's called Monsterverse over at Warner Brothers. That's what they're establishing. Over at Universal, it's the Dark Universe, which is the monsters. That what's drawing people to the movies nowadays. These saga pieces, these films related to one another that will keep people going because, you know, why? They're familiar. So people like them. So people know that, oh, I can anticipate this next movie coming up the following year. And that keeps anticipation levels high and money, you know, in their pockets. And plus, these franchise movies are dependable. You know that if you can get one off the ground and it's successful, then the sequel will be just as successful, maybe a little bit less. But if you actually tweak it and do better, which they can with this Mummy series, then, you know, the money will come. It's to the point now that studios have all the control. The movie star is dead. You know, we don't need the movie star. They don't need them. Think about all the directors and all these different people that they're just scheduling, that they're putting into in these roles in these random roles for these comic book heroes what's his name was a washed up actor what's his name robert downey washed up and then they got the australian actor helmsworth you know he was just you know pretty boy on screen who said he's no one said this guy was going to come out and be a movie star he had the movie star looks and everything but hey you look at him it's like yeah okay dama does it but now he's attached to something that is ever going and disney will you to employ all these people if they can so that means a lot a lot of other uh, studios like fox and one of us they want in on that that is stability that's safety right there instead of trying to throw money on projects that you that might not do well might as well do something where you have people and you know the audience is going to be there once you release it let's go back there but you know tom cruise he's not off the hook because it just wasn't a good movie. And a lot of times, I guess, the script, if people can turn away from acting like, uh, uh, turn away, sort of like when you give Nicolas Cage a script and you say, Nicolas Cage, be Nicolas Cage, and then he goes crazy. Tom Cruise can do that as well and totally uh, over-exaggerate his own mannerism for a role. Now, you tell me, how many other roles recently has Tom Cruise where he wasn't just Tom Cruise? You know, with a different name. I really have faith in Tom Cruise. I really like him, but I just want to see a little bit more. Just throw in something else in his own um, plethora, in his own um, zeitgeist or his assortment of films, his upcoming projects. Throw in like a little, a little fluff piece, a little drama, maybe an indie. That'd be pretty neat. See him go back to indie roots, and, not indie roots, but do something indie with a, like as a father or something like that. That'd be dope. I would like that. Does the underwhelming success of The Mummy doom the dark universe it doesn't it doesn't doom it it might seem that way right now but no it does not doom the dark universe they can still Warner brothers can still recuperate or universal i'm sorry they can still recuperate from the failure of the movie now they're not going to earn back any of that hundred plus million dollars that they lost but they can earn back you know like i did like i said again credibility towards upcoming projects within this universe you know universal slated eight releases for the next 10 to 15 years and among those releases are frankenstein dracula the wolf man the invisible man and most of us are familiar with all of these movies in some way or another because remakes within the past say 20 years all of them horrible like this for example i frankenstein hollow man i kind of enjoyed hollow man dracula untold actually i pretty think i thought they had something there for the sequel but they never put it into production uh and the wolfman that horrible benicio del toro movie 
which for your information is why Emily Blunt did not take the role of Black Widow in the Avengers movie. Therein lies the problem. You know, we too, it's right there. It's stated right there in those four films. Too much dependency on pre-existing characters with films when there are at least a handful within the lot of the monster universe, the creature features that Universal has produced and put out there that audiences know little to nothing about. For example, here's some other examples. Weird Woman, The Frozen Ghost, Pillow of Death, and The Mole People. Any of these titles could kick off a franchise going in a new direction. Go with the lesser unknown because ignorance sells, sometimes more than notability. With the less unknown, there's the ability to envision, to create a true beginning and set the stage for a character or a set of characters we haven't seen in a movie in ages. Okay, now chew on this. Why? When we think of Dracula, does he have a widow's peak, spells, pale skin, and a cape? Because the movie gave us an image of a character from the page. Bram Stoker's Dracula, totally different from the movie that we saw, the movie portrayal. In the book, he never talked about a cape, never talked about doing a lot of things that the Dracula we know does. You know, sucks blood, goes at night, does all these different things. Yeah, he was creepy, but he wasn't as stereotypical a vampire as we made him by way of pop culture. Hell, think about another film, um, Nosferatu. He's a vampire. Totally different than anything you've ever seen on screen. This dude was just decrepit. You know, he was ugly. There was no romance scene, no tantalizing aspect to him. He was just old and withering and monstrous. So, you have to think about where we, how we contextualize these things and where they we get these images from and how do we get those images we get those images from people actually who paint a picture of the creature or the thing the character that we want to see or manifest itself on the screen from our imaginations theirs and ours um everyone picture think about this one twilight everyone pictured bella and Sparkle Boy is not being Christian Stewart and Robert Patterson. Patterson. However, we do now. Harry Potter, Harry, uh, Hermione, and Harry himself. A lot of people, when you read the books, you think of it differently. You have a different interpretation of it. Now, to put that into the context of what we're talking about, new beginnings. You know, audiences, they like to be surprised. And what higher of a cliff to jump off of would there be than to introduce us newcomers to this genre of film with a movie no studio, even Universal, has sought to remake ever? The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Here's a monster movie no one particularly likes as a monster, as a model monster that is known by everyone. He's no Dracula nor a Wolfman, but he is obscure, a derelict among notable names with too many too much film history the mummy is old news the creature from the black lagoon poses an interesting challenge to anyone brave enough to script a movie about a lake creature who sees a girl and terrorizes people together and with that as an idea we now have the shape of water amongst major contenders within the award season this year and this is basically a creature feature. I haven't seen it, but I will see it. And I will report back to you. Eh, maybe the next couple of episodes when I finish and conclude this um, series of films surrounding the monster universe or the creature feature. The creature from the Black Lagoon will not fit into the current action narrative of this dark universe. For the purpose of the storylines, it just doesn't make sense. So I'll. I think that if they want this dark universe to succeed, they will actually have to scrap the mummy and start over and make smaller films. Take that huge budget that they use for 
the mummy and make smaller movies within this universe to really get people interested in and what they have to present and you know take a page from disney hire directors on the indie circuit who specialize in horror like anna lily and mapur amir poor you know who directed the bad batch and her whose first film was a vampire spaghetti western and a girl walks home alone at night that there equals potential and getting people into the theaters because now you're introducing them to something they have not seen rather than saying, Oh, you remember the mummy. Let's make the mummy again and have you come out. Um, this one mummy, most likely some people will say maybe a waste of money and they should have maybe used it wisely universal and invest in more content. Now Disney has a, had a lot of success, but they do that by investing and keeping their creativity flowing and doing so by hiring an assortment of directors and actors and writers to produce films within the franchises they aim to keep around for years to come. They project that there's for like 20 years plus of films with going on with Star Wars, the Marvel Universe, and whatever else now they have, like maybe the films from Fox. So they really have a, an idea of where they want to be and where they want to go. Sure, they had some misses, but they continue to create. So what I think a lot of these other smaller, not they're not smaller, they're major studios as well, but they seem smaller in comparison to Disney right now, is they need to just get off the blockbuster bandwagon already. You know, series are where the money is at the moment. So, but they just have to learn how to present that to the audiences, get them interested in the 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 stories they want to tell and with the dark universe there are so many weird off based movies that you can that you can introduce to audiences and really entice them to come and watch and that's what we need now more than ever you know take from the bottom of the totem pole and climb to the top that is dracula Disney get, didn't get to the Avengers without Iron Man. The Avengers is the product of Iron Man, Thor, and even the Incredible Hulk. And some of those movies didn't do well upon release. You know, Sergio Leone didn't get the good, the bad, the ugly without a fistful of dollars. You know, we need to exercise some risk and make a damn good mole people movie or a creature from the Black Lagoon. Now, Universal could produce at least four films for the cost of that one mummy movie and maybe you know go go further and go to streaming outlets and produce even smaller titles um, with like Netflix or Hulu work to keep it simple and give audiences content right now and one of the things that's untapped that is being tapped by like James Wan, Bloomhouse, and was that one? A and um and a Pearl Pictures. Like they're taking horror movies and they're doing them differently, telling different stories. If a shark movie, if an indie shark movie with Mandy Moore can drum up business on a shoestring budget, I'm sure a company like Universal with a long history of successes and cast talent could get audiences excited about something that isn't comic book inspired. They just have to take some risk. And that doesn't mean spending $160, $80 million on banking Tom Cruise and Tom and Russell Crowe. It's just telling banking, taking $180 million and using that to tell a better story and create the next movie star, the next blockbuster movie star or credible actor out there that people might come to the movies to go see. All right. Now let's go to the next subject. Um, scoop to short. Here's my scoop to short for this episode. Criticism and the risk of watching movies. 
Now, I'm a huge proponent of just going to watch movies, but you have to be real. Uh, we all have jobs, we all have money, and sometimes we just don't want to go do that. That's why Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and all these different services where we just pay one fee for a year or every month, and then we get to see movies. Why that's so attractive to a lot of us. What I'm talking about is what happens to a mo- to a film when a movie is rung out over the coals before the weekend of its release. Before online criticism and the internet, you had to pick up a newspaper, a newspaper, flip to the entertainment section, and read the latest review from your favorite entertainment columnist. Columnist. However, now in the age of accessibility, many of those single opinions operate as a collective voice within sites like Rotten Tomato and Metacritic. Good or bad, the review was less than a scathing hit piece or and more like a work of art. Words, the words on the page, on the newspaper page, weren't necessarily meant to hurt or influence someone away from watching a film, in most cases, I might say, but to inform and give moviegoers insight from a professional's, a professional point of view. And I have to put that in quotes. Leading columnists, columnists got their statuses from the people, the people who respected their opinions or found them entertaining. I don't think that their pieces, that these pieces, that their criticisms weren't exactly meant to lull people away from the box offices or a certain title of film, except for when Robert Ebert tried to take down um, David Lynch's film. One of that one film that he didn't like. Red Velvet. Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. Um, you know, that one was just like a hit piece. He didn't like it and he wanted to tell him why because he felt strongly about it. But, you know, people re- read reviews either because A, they couldn't make it to the cinema, B, they enjoy talking about movies, or C, the talent reviewing the film. You take some of the popular rag, news rags of the 1980s with Ebert going at everyone he disagreed with about a film. Ebert was an expert at both the subjective and objective criticism of a film. What if one of his columns was reduced to 140 characters or less? Let's take side effects. The Steven Soderbergh picture, you know. Here's, here's my 140 characters or less. Steven Soderbergh starts off telling one story to abruptly shift gears or in order to tell a completely different one. Three stars. There are 879 more words to this article that lays out the film's plot. R- Rooney Mara's awesome performance in only her second acting, acting role and criticism of Soderbergh's overuse of the long shot. It's not that Rotten Tomatoes is bad for the information it provides. We're just lazy visual stimulus monkeys who prefer pretty colors and cute shapes. Any one of us searching that site or any other magazine site like it could click on the review from one of those critics from whom they compiled their scores for a movie and go to their site and read all of what they wrote for a better understanding of their opinion about whatever film. But why bother, right? It hurts to read from a phone, first of all, and that's why we swipe. We swipe, we swipe, and we keep swiping, swiping until convincing ourselves all those pretty little shapes are worth the night out and dollars spent. We need a like Tinder site for movie critics, I think. Keep swiping until someone with, with trusting eyes and a love for Michael Bay action kittens catches our attention. Our laziness takes the risk out of movie watching, which is for me the fun of it all. I liken the feeling to the days of blockbuster video when you would search the shelves for movies and pick one based on the fact that you like the cover. Sure, the movie was shit bad, but every now and then it was worth the risk. The risk in watching movies is the experience of watching movies. You never know what you're going to get. That was horrible. There is, however, an economical aspect to consider. Why waste your hard-earned dollars on a film you know you will not like. That's when film criticism works logistically. However, I urge you to dwell into why this critic gave 
that film whatever score. So your decision is better swayed by your own reason for deduction rather than some pretty icons. Now, did you know that Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic scores are a combination of reviews from critics who contribute to those sites? Credible critics. Critics who have websites where any one of us could find a plethora of opinionated pieces to sway us in a more knowledgeable direction. So don't just read the tweet. Find out the story and be better informed. Or you can just take chances and watch the movie. Form an opinion for yourself, like I like to do. But yet I'm in a different position than other people. I'm privy to watching movies. Remember, a tomato is a fruit. It grows on a vine. As you sometimes buy fruit that doesn't taste good, how will you ever know if you don't cut it up and sample what's inside?